Hello everyone, I'm Benny Cara, and I, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's online event. I'm absolutely delighted to have the chance to talk this afternoon to Georgia Oakley, Catherine Lee and Paul Baker. So just a few introductions. Georgia Oakley is a BAFTA nominated director and screenwriter with an interest in convention defined female led narratives. Her debut feature, Blue Jean, premiered at the 2022 Venice Film Festival where it was met with critical acclaim and awarded the Giornati Degli Autori Audience Award. Following the film's UK premiere at the London Film Festival, it was nominated for 13 British Independent Film Awards. The film will be released on uh, the 10th of February in the UK, which is tomorrow. We are also joined by Paul Baker, who is the Professor of English Language at Lancaster University. He's written 22 books on language, sexuality and social history, covering topics that include Section 28, Polari, gay men in the Merchant Navy and newspaper coverage of LGBT plus people. And lastly, we have Catherine Lee, who is the Professor of Inclusive Education and Leadership and a National Teaching Fellow, an award which recognises her work nationally to improve equality, diversity and inclusion in schools and universities. She's dedicated to improving equality, diversity and in inclusion in education, and she was originally a teacher. And through her teaching, curriculum design and continuing professional development, she educates students on the importance of inclusion in their chosen careers. She's published lots of books and articles on equality, diversity and inclusion in education, and her research has featured in the national and international press. She's advised the DfE on LGBT equality and diversity. So Georgia, Paul and Catherine, welcome. Thanks very much for sharing your time with us today. So I'm going to get started with some questions and I'm going to ask Georgia some questions. I'm, I'm really excited to hear about your, your film. Um, and I'm, um, you're conscious that your film starts with a radio news piece on the government's involvement in the arts as Margaret Thatcher becomes the patron of a scheme to get business and patrons involved in the arts while the government is under fire from figures in the arts world because of section 28. And section 28, as we, as we know, is legislation that prevented teachers from talking about sexualities in school. It was a, against the law to, to mention it. So why did you choose to start the film in this way? And, and can you tell us a bit more about the way art and artists reacted to the imposition of Section 28? Yeah, I guess what was interesting for me as a filmmaker looking back on this period, um, as someone who was born in, in 1988, which is the year that the film is set, um, I had access to uh, archives, the BBC archives, the ITV archives, all the newspapers from the time. And what I found was there was a lot more coverage about um, the possible impingement of uh, study material or, or, or um, the sort of, uh, th 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 there, were, there was a lot spoken about how Section 28 would affect the arts and how and there were actors coming forward, as you probably know, Ian McKellen famously came out on uh, on Radio 4 uh, speaking about this issue. Um, and that when we went through all the archives, we found a lot of content um, where where actors were lobbying uh, to, to oust this law because of how it might affect um, the funding of plays or how it might lead to uh, books and films and pieces of art with any sort of gay content from being essentially censored. Um, there was a lot of discussion about that on, on, on the news. And what we found was that there was obviously not really any discussion about how it might affect the lives of working teachers at the time or students. Um, so partly that was why we chose to to start the film with that, uh, with that clip, um, but also for the sake of the narrative, I wanted to introduce the idea of uh, the law being spoken about on 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 the news, but but not um, engage with it in the same way that we were going to wrestle with that issue in the film, if that makes sense. So the film is is a portrait drama about a teacher working the year that Section Twenty Eight was introduced, and it's very much a, an interrogation of one woman's life and choices, and that was always the intention with the film, um, and so. I wanted to really put the viewer right in her headspace and, and to experience this sort of um, 
discussion of section 28 but not in a way that was going to affect her life so much directly if that makes sense that makes absolute sense um, and i think for a lot of teachers it will really resonate um, to have that representation um, there's definitely a sense of uh, an irrepressible sense of paranoia and dread and feeling watched in your film a dread of being found out perhaps and so what would have actually happened to a teacher under section 28 if they'd been found out per se well, I guess what we found to be so interesting about this law was the was that the sort of um, the tangible threat, the, the 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 sense that one might lose one's job, was there, and it was kind of hovering. But actually, what we found to be much more insidious uh, in terms of the effects of the law was the uh, the, the the spiraling paranoia that was a result of not just the law but um, the public opinion at the time and how it was being reported and a sense that this law was one of many uh, aspects of this kind of uh, surveillance type um, culture. Uh, and it was an example of institutionalized homophobia, but it, it wasn't with the film anyway, we decided that what we found to be interesting was that uh, the psychological impact of existing in a world where this kind of law was allowed to exist, um, that was what led to the kinds of uh, emotional turmoil that we were interested in, in depicting in the film. So in answer to your question, um, that there was a teacher that was sacked in the lead up to section 28 coming in and he was then reinstated. But for instance, that was interesting because his sacking was reported in the in the paper. And so we were thinking about, well, if you were a teacher at that time, you would have read that newspaper and seen that a teacher had been sacked in Bradford. And you would then believe that your job was in jeopardy, just jeopardy just as his was. The fact that he was then reinstated a few weeks later um, was a very, very small um you know almost impossible to find column weeks later and so it, it was something that we were always thinking about with with the research of the film um was you know that the lack of information or what information was out there and how that would have affected not just teachers but pupils that were uh living um under this kind of surveillance um and and having this sort of paranoia about outing themselves so it's a sort of wishy-washy answer but i guess what i'm saying is is that yes there was a, a worry of losing one's job but actually after section 28 came in um it, it's more um uh, the, the effect on the teachers and the pupils at the time is less to do with that threat of, of losing one's job and more to do with the culture of silence and shame that arose um, as a result of, of the law. I certainly think you know the, the focus on paranoia is effective because when you don't know what's going to happen because perhaps you're not seeing case after case after case and not seeing reinstatements it's the fear of what might be rather than the kind of reality of it um but you're right about the kind of shame aspect of it and the fact that you know this the culture of silence was far more damaging in some ways than the consequences of um, mentioning homosexuality in schools and, and that's the legacy I think that's been left for um, a lot of students uh, who were in school at, at that time. Um, so um, you're not a teacher, so how did you get that sense of authenticity and in, in experience um, of Jean in your film? Did you, did you research that? Well yeah, we had a very lengthy research um, process. It was almost four years from when I started writing the script to when the film actually got made and um, we very early in that process I, I came across a, a collection of interviews with lesbian PE teachers who'd been working at the time and through contacting the academic who had put together that paper I was then put in touch with some of the women whose lives had been affected and my producer and I um, drove around the country meeting some of those women and speaking to them and interviewing them ourselves and that process never really ended um Catherine was was a part of that process and and we were keen to uh, involve 
Catherine and the other women that we spoke to throughout, you know, the lead up to actually getting their cameras rolling. And we and we we asked um, we asked our actors and our costume designers and um, almost everybody who worked on the film was able to reach out uh, to Catherine or Sarah, who's one of the other teachers that we work with, to ask questions if needed about that would essentially help the overall authenticity of uh, the story and then also I guess it, it, this is a story about internalized homophobia and overcoming that and overcoming a sort of shame um, that's linked to sexuality and I think that that's something that's more timeless and less rooted in this particular moment that I wasn't a part of so I was able to infuse it with some of my own experiences too which hopefully um, you know contributed to the overall authenticity of Jean's struggle. Um, but yeah, it was it was very heavily researched. We spoke to probably up to a hundred people whose lives had been affected, some of whom were um, activists uh, whose experience was entirely different from the teachers that we spoke to, some of whom had um, you know, uh, started Stonewall, started um, LGBT History Month. Um, we spoke to anyone and everyone that we could who we felt ha would have a perspective mm -hmm. um, on the story. And, and because the story is also set in the Northeast, we also spoke to quite a few members of the queer community from that area who were able to provide much needed texture for the uh, lived in world of that teacher in that particular place at that particular time. It's really interesting that you, you talk about that, you know, that timelessness and also the kind of the, the ongoing impact of it. Um, when I started my teaching career in 2003, that was the first year that uh, Section 28 was not in effect. Um, but going into the into the profession at that time, you know, you had that anxiety um, and certainly talking to a lot of teachers who had gone before me, that was very much present in, in their consciousness. Um, so, yeah, I can understand actually the, hearing the stories that you did um, and that it resonated over, over time as well. Thank you, Georgia. I'm going to turn to Catherine now um, because you mentioned that Catherine was one of the people that you had interviewed and been involved in this process. Catherine, your experiences as a teacher in the 1980s were drawn upon in the writing of Blue Jean. Can you tell us a bit more about what teaching in the 1980s under Section 28 was like? Yeah, um, I began my teaching career um, in 1988, just as, um, and, as Section 28 started. And so to an extent, it was, it was all I ever knew for 15, for 15 years. Um, but I can really resonate with, uh, with everything that George has said around dread and the, and the paranoia. And for me, I think there were sort of three abiding emotions that I kind of lived with every day. And the first one was that dread and fear, that fear of being found out, that fear of betraying something about my, my personal identity and the conversations that I would have in the staff room or in the, the, the classroom and, and managing that kind of um, intersection between the personal and the professional on top of you know, a really demanding job, as we all know, secondary school teaching is, was absolutely, you know, absolutely exhausting. I mean, the, the other overwhelming kind of emotion during that time was guilt. Um, the Blue Jean um, also tells the story of, uh, of a young netball player, Lois, who is um, struggling with her own sexual identity. And uh, there were lots and lots of Lois's um, that I came across in my in those 15 years at school and uh, you know so there's this sense of guilt that I wasn't a role model and that I was letting them down um, the way in which I you know I, I would walk through the corridor and if I heard homophobic language I, I wouldn't I wouldn't stop and address it if I heard other sorts of language I certainly would but there was always that fear that, oh, could that be turned on me? Is this promoting homosexuality? Um, so, so the guilt was was overwhelming, and I, and I think the the third sort of abiding sense of that time was one of shame. You know, the law had said that I was not fit to be around young people as my authentic self, 
And when that's the status quo for 15 years, you know, one can't help but internalize that. Um, and I've, you know, I've written quite a lot about internalized homophobia, but, um, you know, I took that with me into other areas of my life as well, where my nieces and nephews were born. I, I, I worried that, you know, I, I somehow, you know, I, am I, does, it, does everybody think I'm a bad influence on young, uh, on young people? Uh, and I guess for me, I, I left teaching in 2010 and moved into higher education. And it wasn't until I moved into my first role in the university uh, and I brought my whole self to work for the very first time, I, I understood the extent to which um, Section 28 had just been so oppressive. I think, I mean, certainly um, hearing about it as somebody who didn't live through that as a teacher, it fascinates me because, you know, bringing your authentic self is seen as part of being an effective teacher now. And that doesn't mean disclosure necessarily, but it does mean feeling comfortable in your own skin, being able to talk with um, conviction about what you believe. Um, and so the idea that you're not allowed to do that, you know, hiding that part of yourself would have been really, really upsetting. Um, and, you know, that sense of guilt and shame, I recognize that as well. And I think there's a legacy of that, that internalized homophobia still, I think, has a not has had um, kind of uh, roots in Section 28, where even now, if I think about coming out as a teacher, I'll stop and I'll think, what am I doing? How am I influencing? All of those thoughts that you don't really want to go through your head will still go through your head because that legislation was there, that belief was there. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, thank you for sharing that very, that personal view. Um, so how did you and Georgia come to work together? And what was the experience like for you? Yeah, well, I had an email out of the blue um, from Georgia's uh, producer, Helen. Uh, back in 2018, I think, asking whether they could uh, chat to me about my uh, my, my experiences, and um, and and so we I had a, a phone call initially, uh, I think, and I recalled um, some uh, writing I'd done around um, my own experiences as a teacher during Section 28. I'd drawn on uh, on, on some diary entries from that era, so um, I sent those to, to to Georgia. And of course, then the pandemic hit, and I have to say, I thought no more about uh, about Blue Jean. And it, it wasn't until 2021, I think, um, that uh, they got back in touch and. Uh, it, you know, it became incredibly exciting and lots of fun. I uh, I got to spend some time with uh, Rosie McEwen, who plays uh, who plays Jean in the film, and uh, we spent hours. And she seemed to ask me about every aspect of my life, not just my life as a teacher, but you know, sort of coming out to my parents and my childhood. And um, you know, she clearly really wanted to get a sense of of the sort of whole person. Um, I, uh, I I dug out all lots of old photographs of uh, of, of me as a as, as a as a, an early PE teacher and uh, and also uh, out and about on the gay scene. Um, I I was in Liverpool. That's where my, I started my my career. So um, and, and worked with a costume team. So so that was uh, that was really that that was really great fun. Um, and then um, I was invited to be an advisor on set for the netball scenes. So I got to spend some time, which, which for somebody who spent their entire life in education was, um, uh, you know, a, a real treat. And I learned, I learned an enormous amount. I guess what I wasn't prepared for was um, that being on set would affect me as, as profoundly as it did. Um, I, I felt I sort of, you know, seeing, seeing Rosie McEwen sort of, um, inhabit this, this character and see this, this PE teacher be so small and timid and anxious. And I, I kind of lurched between feeling, um, incredible frustration with her, um, and incredible compassion for uh, uh, as well, um, and I, I remember as well there was a there was a scene in in the film where um, the Lydia who plays Siobhan um, is is sort of 
uh, asking uh, Lucy Halliday, who plays Lois, about her, about her sexuality, and um, she calls her a dyke. And I, as that scene was rehearsed over and over again, I, I hadn't heard the word dyke for so many years. Um, in the in the as a, as a, a young teacher, it was etched across the uh, the bonnet of my car um, in the uh, in in the late eighties in my outside my house in Liverpool, um, you know. And it was a it was a name that was commonplace, and you know I, I would hear it lots lots of the time. It was really quite triggering to uh, to hear that over and over again um, as the scene was rehearsed. Um, so yeah, it, it was. Um, there were lots of examples of of where actually tra being transported back to the nineteen eighties um, was did affect me, you know, quite quite significantly. It feels a bit of a cliche to say it was my Dickens Christmas Carol moment, but in some ways that was what it was like. I I went back to the nineteen eighties and saw somebody, you know, having similar experiences to those that I had. And realizing with hindsight that you know Section Twenty Eight came to nothing, you know, and and actually, what might have happened had had Jean been out in the school workplace? What had happened if any of us that that were teachers at the time had come out in the workplace? Who knows? Who knows? And and that's the that's the reality of it. You know, we can only can only guess at that. Um, but certainly, the idea of um, reliving the trauma, you know, because it is, it's, you don't, sometimes you don't recognize the trauma until you go back and relive it. It's very Freudian, but it's true, you know, the sense that um, being back in that space could trigger those feelings um, and perhaps actually kind of give a whole new perspective on it. Um, so, my last question to you for, for now, Catherine, is well, you know, you work with schools, you work with um, equality, diversity, and inclusion initiatives. So, do you feel that schools are safer spaces and safe work environments for teachers who are LGBT today? I mean, I I, I absolutely agree with you. I think Section Twenty Eight has left a legacy, um, and I think it still casts a, a shadow. I did some um, I did some research on the legacy of Section 28 and found that 64% um, of the lesbian and gay teachers that I spoke to had accessed help for anxiety and depression at some point rated uh, related to their, um, their their sexual identity and their identity identity as a teacher. Um, you know, a law doesn't get embedded into the culture of a school for 15 years and then suddenly stop in 2003 because the law has changed. And, you know, the media largely didn't report the repeal of, uh, of Section 28. And, and I think schools were, were largely unaware that Section 28 had been repealed and continued very much in, in the same way. But as you say, you know, I, I work with I work with schools a lot, um, and I think there's lots to celebrate. When when I go into uh, to, to work with uh, teachers as part of the LGBT leadership program that I uh, I run, um, I, it's always brilliant to see schools celebrating Pride, having Pride clubs, celebrating LGBT History Month. It's always brilliant for me to see um, LGBT teachers be their authentic selves and, and be the role model that, that I could never be. So, you know, I, I think that whilst Section 28 has left a legacy, there is a heck of a lot to celebrate. But um, I also think that the progress that we've made is precarious and easily lost. And you know, I, I, I saw over the weekend a, a petition, a government petition to remove LGBT content from relationships education. Um, so I think, you know, we, we, we mustn't rest on our laurels. We mustn't think that schools are LGBT inclusive places. There's still plenty to do. Um, and, and some of the narrative, particularly around um, the, the activities of our government are, are, are something we need to, uh, to be very concerned about. Absolutely. I saw that petition and I have uh, retweeted viciously the, um, the counter petition. And what fascinates me about those petitions is the vocal minority, the people we perceive to be a vocal minority against LGBT education, um, seem to be gaining much more 
attention um, that that petition is has been signed by more people. I think there's a complacency sometimes that comes with a kind of swing towards more liberal societies that you know, surely that won't happen. And yet the counter petition doesn't have as many signatures uh, because people think it will be OK. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's a, it's a sign not to rest on our laurels, as, as you as you rightly point out. Thank you, Catherine, um, for all of your comments. Um, I want to turn to Paul, and Paul, you have done so much, and I want to start with talking about your book, because in your book, you mentioned a plot line from EastEnders in the 1980s, and it's a romance between Colin and Barry, which ended in 1987, as well as of the play The Two of Us, which shockingly was censored by the BBC. Can you tell us what you found in your research about how the BBC felt uh, about and reacted to Section 28 and what this meant for content in on our TV screens? Yeah, so it's clear that the BBC was spooked, I think, to start with by Section 28. Now, the law didn't apply to television channels, but it, the, world, the wording of the law was very vague. And it sort of reflected, I think, more the homophobic atmosphere of the time. So it gave the media certain newspapers more legitimation to attack queer themed television programming. So it's really difficult to know what actually happened behind the closed doors of the BBC, but, and there are conflicting accounts of, of what happened um, around that period. So as you said, East Dennis had these two gay characters. Um, I remember I was very interested in watching them and I, I sort of studied um, Colin quite, quite kind of covertly thinking he might be a role model. Um, they, so he had a boyfriend called Barry who was quite a bit younger. They split up on New Year's Eve, 1987. And Barry left Colin and got a girlfriend. Um, and then later, the actor who played Barry, Gary Hale, said that the relationship got cut because it didn't fit in with Section 28, um, which seems seems a terrible shame. Um, I spoke to Michael Cashman, who played Colin um, for the book, though, and he told me that perhaps they did this to reflect more what was happening among um, young working class men at the time who were going back in the closet because of this homophobia that was so prevalent in society. Um, so whatever happened, it didn't they didn't have that relationship and I kind of missed out on, on, on sort of see, seeing this relationship, which was the one relationship I wanted to see on TV. There was another one though, this play, The Two of Us, which you mentioned. Um, now this was a made for TV movie. It was broadcast two months before Section 28 became law. It was, it was a very, very sweet story. Two teenage boys of school leaving age, they fall in love and they go on holiday to the seaside to escape their families. It's very much of its time, lots of saxophone and synthesizer music. Um, Kathy Burke, the comedian's in it, she's got a great early role as well. The Sun was furious, they said it shouldn't be screened, um, so there was always kind of fury around it. And the BBC came to a compromise, they showed it at half past 11 at night, and I remember staying up late, the sound turned down to watch it on television while my parents were in bed. Um, I really enjoyed it, but then it got to the end, and they cut the ending slightly, so the two boys didn't end up together. Um, and I remember watching this, I was about 15, thinking, you know, well, that wasn't what I was expecting or hoping to see at the end. Um, so quite a shame. They did at least screen it two years later on, the full version. But it is fair to say, I think there was a dearth of queer themed programming from the BBC for quite a long time after that. It isn't really till 1999 that you broadcast, they have this um, gay themed magazine called Gay Time TV. So there's a whole kind of decade, hardly anything, pretty much nothing, um, you know. And I think Section 28 was the reason for that. I think certainly uh, that the impact was felt not just in schools, as, as I think um, Georgia pointed out earlier. Um, and the, the the change in, I suppose, climate started in the late 90s. Um, can you tell us about the findings of the national campaign for the arts report in 1997? Because that may have had a role. Yes, so this was the National Campaign for Arts was launched in London in 1985. Its president was Melvin Bragg. And over the years, it's been chaired by various people, Joan Bakewell, Kate A.D., Samuel West. So in the mid-1990s, its director was Jennifer Edwards, and she produced a report in 1997 looking at the impact of Section 28 in the theatre. And the report concluded that since it had become a law in 1988, Theatre in education companies had avoided work by gay writers or plays that featured gay characters. So essentially, these groups all had to, to self censor um, in order to survive. And you know, there was, there was a kind of devastating effect really on, on the arts um, in schools. A lot of arts groups had relied on funding, and as well as Section Twenty Eight, the funding got withdrawn. Um, one example would be the, the Avon Touring Theatre which um, had been banned from performing a play in a school just because it had a gay character in. Um, and then it had to close in 1989 because it lost its funding 
um, partly on the back of you know, having having that play banned. There's another very well-known group called Gay Sweatshop, which is part of lots of gay themed plays um, in the 80s. And it applied for three more years of funding in 1990. It didn't get it from, um, and then it had to disband. And the artistic director said that, you know, it's been pulled because of Section 28. Although nobody really wanted to come out and sort of admit that was the case. Um, so a lot of councils were kind of you know, sort of being very cautious about, about giving money to, the, to these theatre groups and arts groups. Um, there was a stu another study by the Cardiff Law School in 1990, which looked at 384 councils. Now, only five of them actually came out and said, yeah, we've used Section 28 to not give funding. But I think, you know, that's just really the tip of the iceberg. And there was, you know, kind of the study um, concluded that there'd been a hidden agenda of anti-gay prejudice. Yeah, it's not often that people want to admit openly yeah. that uh, prejudice is driving your funding decision making. Um, so, you know, I can understand that there's only five. Um, you talk a lot about the story of Section 28 as one of heroism and humour. Why so? How so? Well, this was a time when homophobia, homophobia was peaking. Um, there was a survey, a social attitude survey carried out in 1987, and it found that 75% of the British public thought that homosexuality was either always wrong or sometimes wrong. So that's been quarter of the population. And to speak out, I think, against Section 28 at that point, to come out as gay or lesbian, to go on marches, to campaign, was an immensely brave thing to do. It, it put you in danger. And you know, I think a lot of people didn't do that. They kind of went back into the closet for a while. And so there was a lot of bravery, I think, in terms of what people were prepared to do. And one of my favorite incidents um, from one of the many protests was a kiss in um, that took place in Piccadilly Circus in 1990, where lots of same-sex couples kind of kind of flooded the area and sort of kissed each other. Um, and a member of Gay Sweatshop, which had just been disbanded, called Richard Sandals, an amazing man, he climbed onto the statue of Antiros and he kissed him. Um, and the statue actually wobbled a bit, you know, an incredibly kind of contagious thing to do really in hindsight, but he just went and did it. And it made a great, a great photograph, which I used as the cover of my book. Um, there's also a lot of humor there too. Um, a very kind of British sense of humour, I think, and um, particularly um, my, my favourites are the young women um, who, who invaded the BBC News at six o'clock. Um, actually, on my 16th birthday, I was watching that eating cake. Um, so that was, that, was, that was very relevant to me. I really enjoyed that. Great birthday present. Um, and they also invaded the House of Lords when they were debating and, and voting on whether to pass Section 28. And when, when I've sort of spoken to some of the activists involved in that and read about what happened, they feel like they're from a carry-on film in a way. Um, one politician was quoted as saying one of the security guards almost lost his trousers when the House of Lords was invaded as there was a sort of struggle against being arrested, just hilarious, really, comedy gold. Um, there's another great invasion which took place at the Ideal Home Exhibition. <laughs> what could be more normal than that? Um, it's Olympia in 1988 and these women occupied one of the show homes and they held up banners which said, one of these days the dykes are going to walk all over you. Um, and I, I just love that sense of sense of humour, um, you know, coupled with, with the bravery as well, which make, makes the process so memorable and, and such fun to write about in a book that could have been you know, incredibly depressing in a way, but it was that sense of humour which really got me through it. I love I love hearing those stories. I love reading about them, and you know my the lasting vision of uh, kind of the chintz and the the helmets of the ideal home show being invaded by by lesbians. I think that that's going to stay with me for a long time. I mean, we speak about activists, and um, you know we're we're heading towards at that point, I suppose, in the late nineties, a kind of uh, movement towards the repeal of, of the Section Twenty Eight. So, what actually led to the repeal of um, Section Twenty Eight, and and how were community activists part of that charge? Well, there's been a decade or so of activism from two groups which, which had very different mission statements. Um, Stonewall was a lobbying group. It aimed at dialogue with politicians and to get key institutions on side. One thing that they did, for example, was they got the support of the nation's children's organisations and also the Agony Ants, which was an incredibly important role to play, I think, um, in secular life. And then there was Outrage, which had a much more confrontational approach based around using humour and kind of shock to get stories in the news. So one thing that they did was they handed out educational materials about sex and relationships outside school gates. Um, you know, and and that, that was seen as very controversial. And um, the two groups didn't see eye to eye at the time, but I think it was quite a good strategy because inadvertently it made it the attack on Section 28 more complex to counter. It allowed more routes to protest so more people could get involved. And these groups helped to change public attitudes. So by 2003, only 31% of people thought homosexuality was always wrong. So I think they did an awful lot of work, I think, in sort of 
you know, pushing things in a, in a certain direction. And, and then we had this change of government in 1997 with New Labour and Tony Blair. Initially, though, he was quite wary about repeal. He was scared of pension of vote, um, what they would do. He was scared of what the tabloids would do as well. And they did try in 2000, the year 2000, to um, repeal Section 28. It failed. There was a re rebellion in the House of Lords and they voted against it. Then there was the newly devolved Scottish Parliament, and they did manage to repeal it in 2000 in Scotland. And so they showed it could be done. And then, you know, th there was other bills that were going through. There was the equalisation of age of consent, allowing gay men and lesbians to serve in the armed forces. And then there was also the European Court of Human Rights, which probably was going to force the UK to get rid of Section 28 if a case was brought against it. And by 2003, quite a, quite a few of the original campaigners who wanted Section 28 had died. So it was a very different time by 2003, different attitudes, a sense that the law had been a huge mistake. And although there was a bit of a campaign to kind of keep it in Parliament by some, some politicians, it was a cross-parliamentary um, kind of kind of that act, um, you know, bill which went through, um, supported by everybody, um, every party. And so, you know, eventually it, it, it did pass. And, and oddly, without a murmur, and it was barely reported in any of the newspapers, which I found very interesting. It's fascinating that that people thought, you know, well, that is a that is a law of its time, as opposed to something that's an ongoing concern. Um, but it certainly felt like a time of, um, I suppose, great hope, you know, of progressive change. Um, the mood of the nation had shifted. You know, I remember being, uh, you know, uh, late in my late teens, early twenties, and feeling that, and then going into the teaching profession. Um, you know, with that sense of, okay, you know, our society is very different now. Um, for you, what is the legacy of, of Section 28? Well, I think it had the opposite consequence of what it tried to do, um, which is quite, quite, quite ironic and funny. It kickstarted the modern gay rights movement. It was such an unfair law that it made thousands of ordinary people get involved in politics and protest. And that resulted in lots of people coming out of the closet, campaigning together, meeting each other, falling in love and having relationships as well, which I'm sure they didn't want to happen through um, instigated Section 28. Um, and also, you know, eventually the changes in attitudes along with the equalising legislation. So the situation for queer people is much better than it was, not perfect, but it's better than it was in 1988. And I think those words, that phrase Section 28, symbolises something else, a sense that our governments aren't always on our side, they don't always get it right. We have to fight for equality. Um, we shouldn't just expect it. And we must be always vigilant. And that's something which um, Catherine kind of touched on as well. You now, there's a very strong feeling amongst you know, people of my generation, well, all generations, that it must never happen again. But of course, around the world, it is happening in places as diverse as Florida and Russia. So it's a reminder, um, again, as Catherine said, not to be complacent, that we might be safe here in the UK to an extent, but we're not safe if we travel. And people are living intolerable lives in other countries and they do need our support. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, that sense of never happening again is such a utopian idea, isn't it? And we know that history repeats itself in lots of different ways and attitudes may appear on the surface to have changed, but actually um, we know underneath that there's, that's, quite a, that's quite a different story. I'd like to bring us all back together now because um, these are, are general questions. Um, and I just want to piggyback on the, the back of Paul's last answer, because, I mean, we're talking about um, the repeal of Section 28 as a success story, essentially, um, and, we, and we know it is, but we're also seeing that increased backlash to LGBTQIA plus rights in the UK, with trans people particularly affected. And as you mentioned, internationally, we're things like don't, the Don't Say Gay Bill recently introduced in Florida. Um, all of this feels like it has haunting echoes of, of Section 28. Um, what changes do you think need to be made in education to protect LGBTIQI plus uh, young people to ensure that um, LGBTQIA plus education doesn't regress but continues to develop and improve? Um, Catherine, would you would you like to share your thoughts with us with us first? Yeah, I um, I guess you know where we are at the moment. I, looking back at Section Twenty Eight, I think that um, at its heart was a fight between the left and right of of politics, and I think that those of us that were lesbian and gay teachers during the time were the collateral there. And when I, I look at, for example, um, 
the gender recognition bill in Scotland and now um, the UK's government's attempts to uh, to block that. I can see um, I can see trans and non-binary people being the same political football that I felt that uh, that that we were back in the day. Um, I, I believe that there's a, a, a desperate education and training piece to do for schools. Um, I think we have come a long way um, as far as supporting um, all students that may have got sort of challenges around their, their mental health and well-being. I think we're more emotionally intelligent as, as teachers and in schools than uh, than certainly we were in the uh, in the 80s. Um, but I, I think that we could, in the fullness of time, look back at this period and see that for trans and non-binary teachers and young people in schools, this was their section 28. So for me, it's, it's education, it's training um, for, for, for staff primarily. Georgia, um, how do you feel about this? Do you, do you feel that we are in, in that, in that sp same space now, politically, um, for some of our young LGBTQIA plus students? Oh, Georgia, you might be on mute. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, I've had a lot of questions um, while we've been touring with the film about progress and how much progress has or hasn't been made. and. Um, I feel very strongly that although we have come, you know, we have made some progress, um, the the attitude at the time that the film is set when Section Twenty Eight came in was um, was a was a general belief amongst parents that if we were if we are to speak about uh, LGBT issues to children, that more children will grow up to be gay, or in this case, trans or non-binary. And as somebody who is now a parent, I see that to be very much still the case. I see, um, I see parents avoiding telling their children about um, me and, and my girlfriend, for instance, and, and why we might look different as a family to the other families in the school. I see people avoiding that with their kids because of this same feeling of if I tell them, then perhaps, you know, I'll be uh, promoting this um, and, and therefore more children or my children might grow up to be gay or trans or non-binary. And I, so yeah, I, I, I do see that progress has been made, but I, um, I feel like we are on very, very shaky ground. And um, Hannah, and when I was pitching the film, I remember I would be in situations with people often who would say, who are, you know, who are you? What are, what do you do? Oh, I make films. Okay, what's your film about? And then I would explain it's about a lesbian PE teacher in the 1980s. And lots of people would sort of be a little wide eyed at that. And, and the response I got often from people who's you know who who um were trying to sort of skirt around the issue was oh well you know the issue right now in schools is is the trans issue and and I couldn't believe that this was what people were coming back with so openly um and I could see the 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 sort of sentiment of the film being shown back to me um in the exact same way and and people didn't seem to be aware of it so yeah I I feel I feel like there's a lot more to be done and I feel uh, concerned about um, where we're going and, and what that means for young people now. Thank you, Georgia. Um, one of the things that I'm conscious of in all of this is the need for safe spaces for young people, whether they're the LGB part of LGBTQIA+, or whether they are the T. And, and I'm, I'm, the gay bar in blue jean feels like such a safe space. Um, what was the importance of safe spaces for LGBTQ plus people? What are they? What's the relevance of that now? I mean, I, I was writing the film as somebody who came out in a world where um, there were those safe spaces were no longer or were beginning to kind of be <clears throat> taken apart piece by piece. And um, and so obviously at the time i guess i was i was interested in how in the, in the 80s if you were out uh, often you were ghettoized to 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 live in a certain place or to do, do a certain job and i wanted to look at a story about somebody who 
wanted to maintain some level of um uh who wanted to have a public facing job and who wanted to um continue to have a relationship with their family and this kind of thing and i was interested in putting the two women in in the film are um uh, very different from each other and one is very much out in all spheres but as a result has it had this experience of being ghettoized and the place that uh the only place where these women were able to really be themselves was inside um the bar as it is in the film um so yeah i mean at the time it was vital and we drew a lot on catherine's uh diary entry that she mentioned that she shared with us about um what those spaces were like and how it felt and then what it felt like when that space was invaded by either a student from the school or sometimes people told us about running into um, another teacher and what that meant or or a student's parent was another one and and what that felt when your one safe space uh, was essentially taken from you because it became this new sort of battleground so yeah I mean I think it, it's very sad to me that um, that these spaces uh, uh, don't really exist so much anymore. And um, I think we, if we can, we should try and um, you know understand how how important they are and try and you know get some kind of change happening in that sense as well. Because young people right now, you know, there's a sense that oh, everyone's got TikTok and this, that, and the other, and everyone's so much progress has been made we don't need those spaces but we absolutely do um so yeah that would be my two pennies and um, paul um do you feel that safe spaces uh, are still necessary for our for our young people even though we don't live in the section 28 world anymore very much so yes i mean in section 28 occurred in a period before the internet and you know, our lives were lived physically much more and safe physical spaces were incredibly important then. And I do remember in the 80s and 90s, you know, these kind of very commercial LGBT plus spaces. And one of the things I remember most about them was the sort of sense of diversity about them, that people from different ages and social classes and different ethnicities came together and mixed maybe in a way that, that doesn't always necessarily happen as much now online, where it's easier maybe to kind of sort into groups which are more similar to, to your age group or, or your social class or your education, things like that. Um, and you can block people that maybe you don't want to, who don't, who don't really match you. And I found those spaces incredibly important for learning about different kinds of people, about their experiences, about a sense of history of, of um, you know, gay identity in life as well. And some of those spaces were so important for activism as well, um, in you know, where people would campaign against Section 28 too. Um, so I think we lose a lot. Um, you know, if we lose those spaces, um, and I, I am quite concerned that, you know, to hear that so many, many gay pubs and clubs and cafes and, and bookshops are kind of closing down um, and ha over the last 10 years or so as, as there's a sort of move to online, or maybe you feel like we're so integrated that we don't need these spaces anymore. I think they still are incredibly important spaces. Yeah, um, they are. You know, and you know you can't replicate that in school, you know, those are, this is part of the LGBT history, the, the, the heritage. Um, of, of an identity and um, you know when you see that that doesn't exist anymore you know it's being replaced by these online spaces it, it's not it's not the same it's not as authentic um, and, and I think finding your place in the world you know but those safe spaces often help people find their place in the world um, and I'm going to refer back to, to Georgia's film because in the in the the in the film there's a line how is that girl going to learn she has a place in this world it's a, it's a something a character says to the main character in blue jean um i'm going to turn to you catherine for our final words and and just kind of summarizing this really so since the repeal of section 28 do we feel that young people are able to learn that they have a place in this world our lgbtqia plus students no matter who they are uh, in our schools I think we, when when I when I look back to the early '80s, I think that we have made leaps and, and bounds, and um, I th I think many of the um, the initiatives around um, diverse um, leadership development programs to encourage um, out um, leaders in schools. Um, means that schools are far more inclusive um, and welcoming places than than they than than they used to be. So I think you know I think we need to celebrate the progress that that we have made. Um, but I think it it goes back to 
Um, I, do our trans and non-binary students at school think that they've got a place in the world? I don't necessarily think they do. And I do think there's significant work to, uh, to continue to, to do. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, I think from my reflections on, on all the, the work that I've done around LGBT inclusion, um, I, I thought coming out was something that was um, reserved to, for those of us that were LGBTQ, but uh, I guess many people feel that they need to come out in their school, in their, their workplace for many different reasons. Lots, lots of people feel othered, feel different. Um, and you know i think what's absolutely key is that there is a culture a welcoming culture um in which you know lgbtq identity is is one is only one identity we're all we all comprise of many different identities mm -hmm. and i think it's a um a, a culture of of being a welcoming place you know mm -hmm. i look to the work that andrew moffat has done on on no outsiders and that's a, a really good example um about you know starting in in primary school to say that uh, that the differences in schools are to be celebrated absolutely thank you catherine um well i'm afraid that's all we've got time for today i could talk to all of you uh for hours but it is time to wrap up georgia paul and catherine many thanks for talking to me today if you are watching today georgia's film blue jean is released in the uk tomorrow go and see it then you can buy Paul's book, Outrageous, the story of Section 28 and Britain's battle for LGBT education. And Catherine's book, Pretended Schools in Section 28 is out now. My own books, Diversity in Schools and uh, Diverse Educators and Manifesto are available for more reputable booksellers. Um, and just a reminder, this event is part of the RSA's regular free Thursday lunchtime series. Check out the RSA's website for more about upcoming events. And finally, thank you again to Georgia, Paul and Catherine, and thank you all for watching. <laughs>